everyone. Welcome to I Thrive. My name is Yvonne Pelkey, and I'm going to be your moderator for today's session. Our mission has always been to provide eye care professionals with the best business tools and resources so that we can help you achieve your goals and find success. And that's the intent of I Thrive. In collaboration with our partners, Edge Pro, iDoc, and iCare Pro, we are very excited to bring you a community that provides practical business solutions for challenges that eye care professionals face today. We are incredibly excited about today's presentation as we have Dr. Larry Golson wrapping up our series on practice culture. A very special thank you to Foxfire for your support in sponsoring today's presentation. As we get started, just a reminder that your microphones are muted so that we can hear Dr. Golson clearly. Comments and questions, just drop those in the chat box at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to them throughout our presentation. Our first series has been all about practice culture and team building. And we've learned from two very successful companies that the key elements in creating, cultivating, and fostering culture is vast. But the underlying theme has been about the involvement of our team. Today's speaker, Dr. Larry Goulson, is going to provide yet another element that focuses on psychological safety. I do have to be honest with you, Dr. Goulson, I had to look this one up. Uh, and so I learned just a little bit about psychological safety. And, you know, kind of what I took from this is that, you know, it's really about the person that's at the helm of the ship. It's about improving broken human interactions. It's about being able to show and employ oneself without fear of negative consequences. And when we as leaders conquer these things, we get the very best from our team. Would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. So today's presentation um, is, is psychological safety is an organizational cultural predisposition for giving candid feedback, openly admitting mistakes, and learning from each other as part of an office uh, code of conduct. Psychological safety has been cited as one of the most important aspects that's led to the success of iconic companies like Apple and Amazon and Google. And it's truly possible to get the best input and feedback and performance from our team if we can cultivate um, uh, psychological safety. Our featured speaker is Larry Golson. Um, he opened his practice in 2008 in probably the worst economy since the Great Depression. His area is saturated with other eye care professionals, and he started his practice with just two team members. Today, he's grown his practice to a medium-sized practice, employed a second doctor, and now has a team of 15 members. He attributes much of his growth to constant learning on how to create a cohesive, collaborative team who delivers top-tier patient care through the Envision eye care experience. He's very lucky to only have to practice two days a week and spends the remaining time working on business development. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Goulson. Yes, thanks for that wonderful introduction, Yvonne. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with everyone today. I'm really excited to talk about this subject because it's near and dear to my heart. Um, and hopefully what I'll be able to do is share something that the listeners that you all can take away uh, that's a value to be able to use in your own practice. That that would be a win for me if you guys could, you know, leave this with something that you've learned that's helpful for your own practices. So I'm going to get into, let's see here, the next slide. There we go. There you go. Thank you. And um, I'm going to ask a few questions as we go through here today. So if the listeners, if you guys are all, uh, able to write down answers to a few questions, uh, that might be helpful. And what I know from looking at a lot of studies is that any lecture and being in school, we listen to so many lectures, we remember about 8% of any lecture when we get up and walk away and life takes back over. So uh, feel free to take notes. And as Yvonne said, chime into the chat uh, if you have any comments or questions. So first question is, what challenges are you facing as it relates to remaining relevant in today's eye care market? Uh, we definitely have a lot of 
uh, pressures on us that we didn't always have, you know, starting back with big box optometry and then also um, now online contacts, glasses. I mean, you can even get your, your uh, exam and prescription online these days. So um, common challenges are in employee engagement, uh, communication, productivity, uh, drama on the team in the workplace. So, you know, you might have some of those or some different ones as well. Uh, but as you kind of ponder that, uh, I want to mention that every, every office has its own culture. And there's been two other webinars earlier this week that talked about culture. And this is another aspect of culture that's really important uh, because every culture in an office, whether it's positive or negative, has its own feel, its own texture, kind of a, a personality of its own in a way. And because a culture can be positive or negative, when we look through the lens of practice development, what we start to realize is that we're, we are small business operators that happen to practice eye care. And I believe that to remain relevant in our field, that we have, that it's incumbent upon us as leaders in our offices to run our practices better than our pre predecessors and to adopt ideals and values and beliefs that other companies have used and harnessed to achieve their own success. They say it's better to copy genius and then create mediocrity. So uh, that might be something that would help us in this uh, situation. What we find is that when the culture is positive, when we're able to achieve that, that it binds our teams together with a common purpose, that it helps our team feel safe within our offices, and that ultimately that increased safety leads to increased performance. Psychological safety is the number one building block of a company culture. So we'll start with defining culture as it relates to your practice. There will be a question and answer time at the end of this uh, webinar. So if you have any pertinent questions, please feel free to be submitting those as we go. Harvard Business Review defined company culture as a culture expresses the values and beliefs of the company and it guides activity through shared conduct and norms. And so our offices have a code of conduct that we operate, what's okay to do, what's not okay to do. And if we've expressly defined, explicitly defined the values of our companies, then it's going to form the beliefs and therefore the behavior of how our teams conduct their behavior while they're at our practice. Google studied this and they studied this, they, they looked at 200 team members and actually gave them like a, a option to pick from 250 attributes for what was the most effective attribute that re ultimately resulted in their success and what was most important for the team members that they, that they uh, surveyed. What they found was the five top attributes that were important for Google's success, psychological safety was by far and away the most important one and was actually the underpinning of the other four, dependability, structure, clarity, and meaning and impact. So all these attributes basically helped their teams, because they have a lot of, uh, a lot of employees, um, build the success of culture, uh, excuse me, the success of the companies that Google appreciates now. And, you know, we talk about Googling something instead of searching something. It's become so uh, common to use Google as a search engine. And it's also, they've got now Google Maps and Google Translate, Google Images. They, they've kind of uh, changed a lot about the way we find information in our culture. And they're the, definitely the leader in that field, in that area. Well, how is culture created? Because often culture is implied and it's not expressly defined. Sometimes culture can develop haphazardly over time from cumulative traits of the members of your team. And it's important to realize in our practices that culture is being created with every conversation, every action, every behavior, and every minute of every day. So it is not a static thing, it's a dynamic factor and it changes daily. And it's also something to realize that it, there are no neutral actions. 
And so every behavior, every conversation that's happening in our practices are either adding to a positive culture or taking away from a positive culture. As leaders in our practice, we are the visionary of the practice and ultimately responsible for ensuring the positive nature of the culture that A, it's created and B, that it's maintained. Although every team member should be accountable for contributing to a positive culture, it is up to the leader to make sure that the positive nature is being realized. And I can share a story with you from my own, uh, my own practice when we were early on in 2008, 2009, all the way up to 2012, uh, we were growing, 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 and then uh, it became clear that we were gonna outgrow our space. And so I ended up purchasing a building across the street from us to move into. So we were going from about an 1800 square foot practice into a 3500 square foot facility. And that new facility needed to be remodeled, and the remodeling was a big, you know, big job. There were a lot of decisions to be made for anybody out there who's done remodeling at home or work. Uh, it's incredible how many decisions have to be made. And so I, I actually took my focus off of my team and was really consumed with building out the new practice. Well, we moved into the new practice, and my, my focus was still not on the team. It was still on making decisions that were happening to finish the build out. And we got extremely busy. And a lot of people wanted to see the new space and see what was going on. And um, I actually, the, the culture just, just plummeted. And people were upset. They were frustrated. They were stressed. And before I could really get a handle on it, I decided, you know what? I'm going to hire a manager because I need to make sure that my team is taken care of. And, and I'm not able to do everything all, all myself. And so I hired a manager out of the Midwest, and um, when she moved down, she took over, and it was the wrong fit for my practice, for my culture, for my town. And over a six-month period, my practice had 100% turnover. So everybody that started uh, and, and was with me for, for years, um, you know, basically jumped ship, and I had to start over with a brand new team. And I actually... Uh, parted ways with that manager from the Midwest and um, had to kind of rebuild the culture. And I learned from that something really important that, you know, it's one thing to create a great culture, which we definitely had in the original space that we practiced in for the first six years. Uh, but it has to be maintained. It has to be something that we give our time, our thoughts, our energy to that we nurture so that it stays at a high level. And it really, it benefits everybody, including, um, from the top to the bottom of the organization. Okay, go back one here. So in the organization that you have, the leader must decide what values to instill into the practice. And you can see a picture above where there is a card deck. And I used a card deck similar to this to create the values of my own practice. And it was helpful for me to really understand, you know, what values are out there and which ones speak to me. And so I had a card deck of about 50 different words on them, uh, on, the car, on the cards themselves. And I picked through and, and pared it down to like the top 20. And then with those 20, I pared it down to the top 10. And from there to the top five values that were important for my practice. And I have a second question for everyone and what values have you as either business owners, practice owners, or managers intentionally decided are important for your practice? So if you wanna write down what values either explicitly that you've stated or implicitly that you've implied, you wanna write down, that would be helpful for our conversation. As I created my own core values for Envision Eye Care, and I encourage the practices that I consult with to do the same. We have to realize that as leaders, we have more influence than we may think. And I have a story to tell about that as well, that I, I guess I didn't think I had as much uh, influence over my team as I do. Um, but I had this one team member that was an optician, we'll call her Madison. And as an optician, Madison really struggled with 
once we once she got to the end of the sale with asking for for payment for the goods and services that we provided and for y'all out there that might be something you've experienced in your own practice and it's, this can be hard for people to do that and so i had to start having candid conversations with with her to kind of understand what her fears were and to address those and and kind of through logic logical conversations talk about why it's okay for us to charge for our goods and services it's okay for us to generate a profit we are a for profit business and we want to make sure that we have uh, enough resources to run the practice to grow the practice and over those series of conversations she eventually transcended her own fears and became very uh, able to to have those conversations with patients with confidence and, and became a great optician that way and eventually she had to move away from my hometown Asheville to the coast of North Carolina and we spoke about a month or two after she had moved and she told me that the professional lessons that she learned while she was at Envision Eye Care really changed the way that she approaches her personal life and her professional life for that matter. And, in, and it really had a huge impact on her life. And I feel like, you know, through those conversations that we had, through the values that we instilled in our practice, um, that helping somebody overcome their fears can be one of the best gifts that we give someone. Dr. Goldberg? Yes. In, in regards to the question that you asked the audience, um, what were some values that they um, thought about for their practice? Accountability, respect, reliability were a few that were mentioned. Those Did are you great. you want to touch on those, being friendly? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So accountability is what I heard. Um, respect. And what was the third one you, you mentioned, Yvonne? reliability reliability staff satisfaction staff satisfaction yeah i love all those integrity integrity yeah, yeah. And, and that's a, that's a that's a great point is you know these are all wonderful core values and i say core values and that's another aspect of business that we're going to touch on here in a minute but um all of those values that that you just mentioned are are great values to have for a company and part of the idea is that everyone on this call all has a different idea about what's most important in their own practices and so any one of those accountability respect reliability staff satisfaction that's a great one too integrity is a, a wonderful one um could be part of your own core values and what are the other four the other several ones that are important uh is something for i i there's two ways to go about this one way is for the leader to decide the owner uh, to make the core values. And another way is to sit down and have a conversation with either the leadership team in your office or the entire office together. Um, I've, I've been told that, you know, as the owner of the practice, I'll be the only one that's a permanent fixture in the practice. So it might make sense for me to create the values. Um, and there's, I guess, in other words, there's more than one way to, to go about that, but those are great ones submitted. So thank you for doing that, everyone. Um, yeah, and I'll tell you just and just in uh, just in comment to what you just said about creating values and who should be responsible. Like one of our speakers yesterday talked about bringing in their entire team um, and having them take part in what those core values are going to be for the for the company. So it's all great points, and I think there's no right or wrong way, um, you know, in how we how we set those core values. That's absolutely right. And we, we didn't do that specifically in my practice with the core values, but we did do it with our mission statement and, uh, and our purpose. And it's a really cool exercise when you bring in the whole entire team to do that because everybody kind of gets, you know, my team, what happened was people were a little bit nervous to speak up at first and then eventually they started to throw out information and ideas and um, together we kind, of, we kind of like crafted our own statements in that way. Um, and it's important once you have cultural guideposts, which ex examples of cultural guideposts, I wrote some down here at the bottom, uh, core values we've been touching on here, and those are fundamental beliefs of an organization. A mission statement is a formal summary of the aims and values of a company or an organization. And the purpose is the reason for which something is created or the reason for which something exists. 
And I, I feel like when I opened my practice cold 08 in 2008, I, I kind of had all an idea of these things, but I hadn't actually written down. I hadn't actually defined them specifically. And to go one step further, how do we actually put energy into them and actually like use them? Because otherwise they're just words on a piece of paper. And so in my practice, uh, and, I'll, and I'll share with you, uh, Yvonne and everyone else, my own core values um, are innovation, candid team collaboration, commitment to excellence, accountability, which is the second time we've heard that, and uh, incompetence. And so the way that we use these core values is really important. And I encourage other listeners, and even when I do consult for other practices, to put energy behind these. And the way that we do that is to hire based on our core values, uh, to help new team members be indoctrinated into the culture of our practice by, we actually have our, our newest, our new team members recite the core values at their first team meeting. Uh, but we also promote based on our core values. We give raises. We even have to fire sometimes on our core values uh, because we want to make them sure that everybody knows them and owns them. And when I say everybody, I also mean even the folks at the top, the owners and the managers, uh, because really and truly leaders aren't worthy of being followed just because of a title like boss, manager, or even doctor. But we actually have to learn our follow, we have to, excuse me, earn our followership by being a model for our cultural guideposts. And so we really won't get too much traction if we're not living by our own values and team members can see right through that. And so we have to, if we're gonna go to the trouble of stating them and talking about them on a regular basis, uh, we have to make sure that we're all accountable to them. So moving past culture into a certain subset of culture, a building block of culture, psychological safety. And if we get this one right, we can, it'll help us build an amazing culture. Apple, Amazon, Google, all sites, psychological safety is one, of, is one of their most important factors of being a modern day superpower in the world of business. And so if, they, if it worked for them, it can work for any business really. To define psychological safety, because I often ask new clients, I say, you know, do you, do you have a sense of what you, how you would define psychological safety? And sometimes people nail it, and sometimes they really don't know what it means. But uh, in our context today, can I take risks on this team without feeling insecure or embarrassed? Or said another way, the level of psychological safety in a group is directly related to the level of authenticity one can bring to the team. And so we don't want to play, put masks on when we're working with our team. We want to be authentic about how we really feel about either how we're doing certain procedures in our office, uh, how we're interrelating with each other, how we're relating to the patients, and do I feel safe to speak up when I have a question or concern. I also want to make sure that this isn't misinterpreted because there's certain behaviors that are acceptable and there are certain behaviors that are not. Obvious behaviors that will end in termination are not associated with psychological safety and those are lying and cheating, uh, stealing and falsifying data. Those all, all those things are not okay. Um, however, if we can think of ourselves as humans working together on really hard things, then we realize that we can fail sometimes that we can make mistakes, that sometimes we show up and we're, we have a hard day and we might be a little bit weaker than we were the day before. Um, we're all going to have problems with conflict and we're all going to make, uh, have a harder time when we're tired performing. I like to tell my team that every day is your masterpiece. That's something I got from John Wooden, who is the, uh, was the coach for basketball coach for UCLA, uh, one of the most winning coaches that ever uh, was a coach for college basketball and one of his core values for himself was to make every day your masterpiece so i teach that to my team and i actually also tell them in the same breath that our masterpiece on thursday will not be the same as our masterpiece on friday because we show up with different rest different stressors in our personal life um, 
different days mean different abilities. And so when we realize that, you know, as humans, we are going to make mistakes, we are going to have uh, days when we're tired, uh, knowing that it's okay for me if I have a day like that, a tough day, um, that I'm not going to get either fired or reprimanded for that is important to build that safety, that feeling of safety on the team. This is a really interesting book called The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande. And Gawande started, he started looking at mortality rates in hospital operating rooms. And what he found was that there is a lot more fatalities in operating rooms than there really should be. And he also found that there is a growing evidence in medicine that there's a lot of, especially in surgery, a culture of blame and fear and hierarchy that causes harm to not just the patients, but also to the staff of the hospital as well. And that everybody in the operating room, regardless of seniority, will work best for the patient's success and, and uh, survival, really, if they have the, the ability to speak up and be confident during life-threatening situations. He found that the fallibility of everyone, even the most experienced experts, means that we need to learn from mistakes, which sometimes have major consequences. And it can be something as simple as washing our hands in the, in the operating room. So once he started to realize what could help reduce mortality, he started to make certain uh, changes in the way that he was consulting for hospitals. And they started to try and make these positive changes to help reduce fatalities by teaching, like kind of like we get taught in school. And that was ineffective. So then he worked with the policymakers in the hospitals to change the rules and regulations of the hospital. He also found that was ineffective at making change in the operating room. What he, what he found in the end was that only through meetings with the hospital staff members, from everybody from the top to the bottom, in a, in a room where everybody felt safe to speak up, were ideas created and ownership taken to help reduce the fatalities. And he was able to harness this information to reduce fatalities in a lot of hospitals by 50% or more. That's a huge deal. I mean, I tell you, if I'm a patient in the operating room, I want to be going to a hospital that has psychological safety for my best care. So that same type of psychological safety is important in our own practices because we're dealing with patients as well. And I think it's important that we realize that our teams are scared of us. Whether you're a doctor or a manager or a boss, by the very nature of that status, we're, we can be intimidating to people. And so with that, oftentimes our employees are scared to make mistakes. They're scared to show when they don't know how to do something. They might be scared to make suggestions for improved operations. And they're also reluctant to tell us when we may have made an unpopular decision or treated somebody on the team poorly. So how do you get past that level of I'm scared to say anything to a place where people can be honest and authentic. Well, when we're told as kids, we were all told as kids, well, most of us anyways, not to say something unless you have something nice to say. And that was something that our culture teaches us, our parents teach us in a lot of cases. And that kind of behavior can actually be crippling in an organization where we have to be honest and straightforward about how things are operating to be successful and to improve our performance. So how do we break that from our childhood? A lot of things from our childhood are carried over into our adulthood, and we don't want that to you know, be a big ball and chain for us to try and carry. As we continue to talk about psychological safety, realize that the road to success is paved with mistakes well handled. And uh, I'll share an example of a time that yours truly made a mistake in the practice. And, uh, it was a time when I really wanted to increase our patient schedule and see more patients per day. And I was meeting with my patient care coordinator. That's what we call our receptionist, our admin folks. And we were sitting there talking and I said, you know, um, I want to I wanna increase our schedule. And Lindsay looked back at me and she said, Dr. Golson, do you think that's the best move right now? And the old me would have said, yeah, I think it's a great idea because I came up with it and that's what I want to do. Well, the reality is, is that 
for whatever reason, in that moment, I stopped and I decided instead to ask a question. And I said, you know, Lindsay, why, what makes you say that? And she said, well, you know, I don't know if you know this, but the team is really stressed out right now. They, they feel like, you know, the patient flow is not going well and that our patients are not, you know, getting the care consistently that they really need that I think you want for them. And it led to about a 20 to 30 minute discussion about what things were happening in the practice that I was unaware of. And there's so much happening in our practices that we're unaware of because there's a lot that happens when we're not watching or we're not listening or we're not able to be everywhere at every time. And so we really want to be able to have our team functioning at a high level, whether we're in the room or we're not in the room. And so that goes back to our culture. And from that conversation, it led to kind of an uncovery, uh, uncovering, discovering process that went on for the next month or two to really understand what types of roadblocks we were hitting on a regular basis uh, from, from the patient care coordinators to the medical assistants to the opticians. And uh, we actually ended up having a retreat to discuss this, a day-long retreat where we met off-site and worked on our office functioning. And it was all because of one comment that one individual happened to say to me that I happened to stop and say, hmm, let me know more about that. So, Hey, Dr. Gordon. Yeah. You brought up a great point on that previous slide that we just came off of when you were talking about, you know, yours truly and, you know, what you had to do, um, you know, to get feedback from your team, right? So it took a lot of courage for that individual to come to you. So mm -hmm. how do you, do you have any recommendations for getting that feedback from the team? Yeah, I, I know do. We have to keep the, yeah. Yeah, thanks for asking that, Yvonne. And, um, you know, to get that feedback from the team uh, kind of leads really easily into the next slide. Um, I think that the best way to get that feedback from the team is to build first a relationship with our team members and to understand that, you know, they are performing a role in our office that they're getting paid to do, but they're also humans. And so what makes them tick? What's important to them on a personal level and a professional level? to build rapport with people, builds trust, and through that trust, they're more willing to say something that might be taken you know, negatively or, or taken um, as criticism. And so I really think to answer that question, we have, to, we have to build that trust on the front end before we expect our team members to open up. Uh, I think you and I talked on today. When we, when we talked on Sunday and we were, we were walking through this presentation, I think one of the things that came to mind when I think about, and you said it very well, which is building that rapport with your team, it goes beyond just the four walls that we work in. Like those become our second family and it's getting involved in their personal lives as well. And what do they enjoy doing and being there to, you know, develop and coach and mentor, you know, even on a personal level as well. Um, and I think when you, I think about, you know, as, as I told you, my resume is super short. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time with the companies that I'm with, um, and one of the things that just makes me feel so good and being able to come have a conversation with somebody is that connection, is, you know, uh, reaching out to me and, and learning more about me as a person, and when I, when I have that connection with somebody, then I'm going to be more apt to open up and have more of an honest conversation and be able to share my feelings because I know that you genuinely care about me as a person um, and it makes me feel more safe to do that. Yeah, that's great. That's great, Yvonne. I think that when I opened my practice, I really imagined, I, I knew what I wanted to create in my practice. I knew I wanted the experience to be a certain way. And I almost saw my team members as like a means to get me there. And it sounds kind of harsh to say that, but I, you know, I think it was just me being young. I think I was like 30, 31 years old when I opened and, and I started to realize that, you know, these are folks with dreams and hopes and feelings and they, you know, they need to feel like I care about them in order to give me their best performance. And, um, you know, being able to build that kind of rapport with people makes them feel valued to be a mentor for them makes them feel like, you know, hey, I'm, I'm the reason 
the reason that people show up every day in our offices is not for me or, or anybody on this call, it's for themselves. So what are they getting out of being there every day and working really hard? That's a great point. Now, we're gonna uh, press on to the next slide because I feel like uh, this will further kind of expand on the question that you asked is how do we get them to open up? Fast forward a year after that initial retreat that we had and during the uh, time in between, my office manager brought this book to me and she said, hey, Dr. Golson, I think we should read this. This book called Radical Candor by Jill Scott, who was an executive at, exec at Apple and at Google, uh, is a New York Times and Washington Post, uh, excuse me, a, a Wall Street Journal bestseller. And the subtitle of Radical Candor is How to Be a Kick-Ass Boss Without Losing Your Humanity. And I love that because she goes on to say in the book that, you know, being a boss or being having, having employees is kind of a newer setup for our, uh, you know, for humanity. It used to be that, you know, people were in charge of other people in feudal systems or uh, in kingdoms and things like that. And the idea of being in a business with managers and, and uh, bosses is, is a relatively new thing in the grand scheme of human evolution. And so, she basically, you know, and I, and I think that everybody would agree that we all want to be really good bosses, but sometimes we don't really know how. And it can be hard to kind of find that balance, as Yvonne was saying, to take a personal interest in somebody's life. You know, I, I, I've gone too far on the other side of that, too. I think I've made most mistakes. I don't know. We'll find out. I'm sure there's still a lot more to make, but I've made so many. And one of them was to be too friendly with my team. And then it became really hard when it was time to either discipline or to have a performance review. So there has to be a balance and a discernment as a leader, as a manager, to know where to draw that line. And I think that comes from intuition and, you know, quite frankly, from making uh, mistakes along the way. And the interesting thing about mistakes along the way, to go back to Daniel Coyle's quote, is that we learn a lot more from our failures than we do from our successes. So when, if you think about, you know, how can, I, how can I instill some of this into my practice? How can I build my culture? It's okay if we make mistakes. We're gonna learn from those mistakes. And realistically, we'll learn a lot more from those than anything else, than actually our successes. So if we think about being a kick-ass boss without losing our humanity, you know, a lot of what she says in this book is, is caring personally for our team and also challenging them directly. As we did book club, we read a chapter each week. We met each week, me and my manager, and, and kind of like took notes and discussed what we learned, which was really effective, by the way, because she would pick up things that I missed and vice versa. And so together, we were like smarter and, and more effective in, in getting the meat out of this book that was important. Well, eventually we took this and we, um, through our book club, decided that it was time to have a day-long retreat again. So it, it, it ends up that our day-long retreat lands in August for whatever reason. It was a second annual uh, retreat that we decided to have. And um, during that retreat, we basically picked apart the book and explained what we had learned about how we want to communicate and lead in our office. And we answered questions from our team to help clarify. And we, from there, started to incorporate radical candor into the way that we communicate in our office. What we found was that we needed to kind of reference this weekly to be able to bring people along with us on this journey because it is a new concept. And if you decide to read this book, and I strongly encourage you to, it was such an important read for us. Um, again, I think that the value is not just in the initial like retreat in our case, but in the actual, how do we use this day after day, week after week. We reference this book and conversations that are had throughout our office on a weekly basis in our team meeting and throughout the weeks as we navigate our days. What we found as a result of the retreat was that at my office, we had improved retention, uh, that we 
you know, we're able to solve problems faster and with greater results. And we had happier, more fulfilled team. It was interesting because our patients started to comment on the positive culture. They, they would come in and they would say, what are you guys doing in here? Why is everybody so happy and giddy and smiley? Are they like, are you guys like pumping something into the air around here? And it was a really cool uh, comment that we would get on a re semi-regular basis. And, um, you know, the thing is, is that it was authentic. And I think some patients even like were questioning, like, is this even real? Like, I've never been to a place that felt this good. And I, I wonder if it's just all an act. So uh, kind of through this, we realized improved retention, uh, all these one through five, you know, that, that we were solving issues a lot faster, whether they were issues interpersonally or with job roles or with the uh, procedures that we had in the office that team members were, were, were lighting up and they were trusting enough to share feedback with us that helped us really change certain things. I and mean, one of my one of my core values is innovation. So we started innovating at a really rapid rate. Um, and we also realized, and I want to also kind of put a, a warning out there that if you do this, certain people on your team might not be up for this level of communication, this type of communication. And that's a really important point because you might lose, you might lose some people that aren't willing to, to go along with this. And we lost one person in particular that uh, was uh, kind of problematic on our team anyways. And she was a natural leader, but she was a leader in leading our team down a, a, bad, a bad place and affecting our culture negatively. And we really didn't know it at first until, you know, she was there for a while. And we were kind of scared to, we were kind of scared to let her go because we knew that she had this sway in the office and uh, with the other team members. But once we started doing this, she opted out. She, she resigned from her position. And um, it was almost overnight that we felt our culture improve after this person had left. And so even if you are going to lose people because they're not on board with this, I'm going to offer that you're probably going to lose the right people. And there's nothing right or wrong about losing somebody if they're not working out in your office. If you, have, if you start to have core values and you start to use a certain communication technique like this and somebody's not on board, it's better for them and it's better for your practice if they exit. You want them to go somewhere else and do their best work elsewhere, but you have to have your team rowing in the same direction at the same time to really get the best performance. We felt that at our office over the next two years after we instituted after we instituted um, radical candor that we grew by 18%. Another case study of this would be Google, and Google found similar results that we did when they improved their psychological safety on their own, in their own offices, in their own organization. Improved retention, enhanced collaboration with their team. They generated more revenue. And it was actually interesting too to read that they, they, their performance reviews improved. So the, the managers that were giving reviews started to see that the marks that they were giving their team members were actually higher after they were psychological safety because it was this open line of communication that was happening and there was just better performance overall. So a couple of key concepts that I want to touch on today. And there were a lot of a lot of kind of gold nuggets out of this book. These three in particular, I felt were helpful above a lot of the other ones. We talked about building trust. And back to Yvonne's question, how do you get people to be honest? Well, trust is the number one building block and the, and the building block of trust is consistency. And so if we can be consistent in the way we show up, if we can be consistent in the values that we instill, and we can show that we really care about team members, they will start to open up naturally. One factor that we use is called a one-on-one. -on -one. And a one-on-one -on -one is uh, Jill uh, Scott, excuse me, Kim Scott wants you, suggests to do this once a week. We do it once a month with our team members because once a week just seems like it's hard to do with each team member. But it's a 20 minute meeting where the team member brings their own agenda and they, you know, they're asked to tell us what roadblocks they're experiencing, whether it's interpersonal, whether it's with a certain system, whether they had a, a hard experience with a patient, 
we ask them to bring the agenda and, and, and ask them how we can be supportive to, for them. We also ask with that, that they bring their own solutions. So we're not there just to like, you know, make up how to fix everything. Uh, we want them to start thinking not only about, hey, I have this issue or concern or problem, but here's a way I think I might fix it. What the leader is there to do is then to take that and take their solution, which by the way, a solution from a team member, even if it's like a you know, mediocre one, is gonna be 10 times more effective than a fantastic solution from me because if the team member came up with it, they're gonna own it. And if they own it, then they're going to be accountable to seeing it through. So letting them come up with a solution is really an important step to better performance. The leader is there more of a, as a guide, as a remover of obstacles to help accomplish whatever concern the team member is having. And I like to personally develop an action plan because a lot of times as a guide, I realize that I have to set like, okay, well, if you wanna do this with, let, let's say for instance, um, we're not gathering the right information about their insurance or their vision plan on the call that they're scheduling their appointment. I'm not gonna sit there and tell them how to do it because it's not my work. They know their work better than I know, but I will help them with guiding them on how to do better with that by asking them, what do you think we should do? And when they offer up a few solutions, it gives me the opportunity to say, okay, well, that sounds like a really good one. When do you wanna do that by? And how does that look? And I'm asking leading questions to help them kind of get to the point of solving the issue. We follow up a, 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 about a month later on their next one-on-one -on -one and ask them how they did so we don't just leave it uh, to them. We, we really wanna follow up with them and let them know, hey, we, we care about your concern. How did it go last month? A second way that we use radical, con radical candor key concepts is impromptu feedback. Impromptu feedback is when you see a behavior in a person that, a team member that you have that's either uh, a positive behavior or negative behavior that you're giving them feedback as close to in time as possible as you witness it. So if it's praise that you wanna give, you can give praise in front of other team members. If it's criticism that you need to give, it's best to pull a team member aside and not give criticism among their peers. Because nobody wants to hear, hey, you're not doing this as well as we want you to do it in front of their team members. So we wanna praise in public and criticize in private. Colin Powell said, in order to lead, you have to piss people off. And I think that if we wanna challenge people directly, we're gonna have to realize that sometimes in challenging people, they're not gonna like it so much. And we're gonna have to kind of like pull them along, kicking and screaming all the way to a better version of themselves. They might not thank you right then, but they might turn around as in Madison's case and, and realize that, yeah, that really helped me. I'm glad that they were, they were a little bit tougher on me than other, other bosses have been on me in the past. The last concept that I'll take from Radical Candor is asking for and accepting criticism. And so I think this is another answer to Yvonne's question earlier, how do you get team members to open up? I actively was asking team members to tell me, what can I do as your boss or stop doing as your boss to help improve your performance or your, your job at, at, the, at our office? And when you ask that question, I used to tell every team member, you know, my door is always open. Please tell me if you have a question or concern. And nobody would ever walk through the door. They were scared. You know, they were scared. So I actually want to sit them down in a one-on-one -on -one and I ask them, you know, what can I do better for you as a boss? Or what can I stop doing or, you know, do less of? And oftentimes when I ask that question, there's silence. They don't say anything. They can't think of anything is what they say. And I know that they can, you know, they have feedback that would be helpful for me. So if they can't say anything right away, I give them about a minute or two to think about it. And it's pretty awkward during that minute or two while they're silent in the room. And oftentimes they will think of something. And if they still can't think of something, then I'll say, okay, that's great. So when we meet again in a month, I really need you to come to, to this meeting with something that I can do better for, for your role to help you. And eventually they start to realize by asking for that feedback that I'm a sincere about it and it's easier for me to give them criticism or praise later when they know that I'm willing to accept it myself. Hey Dr. Goldson. Yes. So you talked about you know um, coming to me with you know or coming to you with some 
things that might be impacting your role and all of that sort of thing. And I remember, you know, in my days, you know, having 11 practices that I was overseeing, if every single one of those employees came and dumped their problems on me and then ran away and expected me to fix it, um, it didn't really help solve the real problem, which is having them be part of the solution. And when they're part of the solution, then they can, then there's more accountability uh, at the end of the day. That's right. That's right. Yeah. If they're, if they're part of the solution, uh, you know, especially when they come up with their, their own aspects of that solution, um, mm -hmm. they're much more likely to be successful with it because they thought of it. And also, look, as managers, we don't want to like solve everyone's problems all day long. That's not a fun job to, to be in. And so, you know, how do we help them take responsibility for some of the things that are important to them? And that's why I feel like we got to be more of a, of a guide as a leader rather than a problem solver. One last point before we move on about accepting criticism is it's important to thank them when they provide criticism because it's scary for them to offer it oftentimes. And even if we, like there's been times where I didn't agree with their assessment of a situation that involved me, but even in that case, like I still thank them and accepted the criticism openly. And the reason I did that was because again, I wanted to model that behavior so that when I have to come to them with criticism, they're more willing to accept it. And it also is more likely that they're gonna share future criticisms with me if I don't get defensive. So we are in eye care. Eye care is all about analyzing data. So let's look at some data. Let's look at some numbers to drive this home. First of all, it's, there's a lot of stats around how expensive it is to have turnover in your organization. In optometry, I've heard it cost twenty-five dollars to $30,000 to have somebody leave your practice, to hire somebody onboard them, train them, and then get them to be effective in their role. I've also heard in other cases that it's a third of the team members' compensation for the year that it's gonna to cost to onboard somebody new after some turnover has occurred. The more influence the employee has on a company, the more expensive it becomes. There's also the intangibles that are harmful with job turnover in terms of relationships with our patients, relationships with other team members, and quite frankly, the body of knowledge that is lost every time somebody leaves. If we're running our practice as well, we have really good standard operating procedures. We have really good content of information that we can use to train the next person and onboard the next person. However, there's still a lot lost when we have turnover. And a study done by Columbia University found that in poor company cultures, that job turnover was 48% compared to a positive company culture of only 14%. Now we can all you know, recognize that some job turnover, some uh, challenges with retention is gonna happen no matter what, but wouldn't it be great if we could minimize that at a high level? We also found, uh, excuse me, I also found with doing the studying and research for this presentation that a Gallup report indicated that in our workforce, it's 63% of employees are disengaged and 87% lack motivation. Now, when you look at that, if you're like me, that's staggering. Those are staggering figures that that high of a percentage of people could be disengaged and lack motivation. Think about if we can get the best of our team, how much better we perform, whereas if somebody is disengaged, they're not going to really care about your practice or care about your patients. And at the worst, they could be sabotaging your practice by creating a poor culture or doing things incorrectly. So to turn it around and look on the positive side, happy employees, and this is the same study by the Gallup report, um, that companies that have happy employees outperform their competition by 20%, that those companies are 12% more productive with 28 28% increase in earnings. If you recall from my earlier slide, we had 18% increase in two year period. And the Gallup study says that oftentimes it can be as high as 28% for, for a great culture with happy employees. So because of that, it literally pays to have employees happy. 
So this isn't just kind of like a woo woo concept, psychological safety, great culture, oh yeah, rah, rah, rah. What does it really mean? Well, if you care about your practice and performance, it will have an impact on the bottom line. And if we can get and focus on getting right our teams, our culture, the way it feels, the ethos of our culture in the practice, then the numbers will improve irresistibly in the wake of that. Of course, we don't need you know statistics to know this. I mean, I think that we all intuitively kind of know that it's really valuable to have a positive culture and to have happy team members. And the question is like, you know, how do we ensure that over time? So some takeaway points. If you take away nothing else, please take away to develop an open mindset. We know that conventional thinking will lead to conventional results. And what we're talking about here, in my opinion, is an unconventional approach to the way we would run our practice. Unconventional thinking will lead to unconventional results. And if we keep doing the same things in our practice as we've always done, we are literally going to get the same results. Create a safe environment. We have to open our hearts and minds to be successful here. We have to build trust by building a personal relationship with the individual, by caring about the entire person, the whole person, I like to say, not just their work selves. The best bosses do this well by caring personally and challenging directly. Develop our active listening skills. The quality of our communication is measured at the listener's ear. So as I speak, how well I'm speaking, I can tell you, hey, I think I did a great job on the webinar today, but really it's up to you to, to determine how well I did because y'all are receiving this information and interpreting it through your own brains and your own minds. I'll oftentimes will mirror comments like in a one-on-one -on -one if the person says, well, I'm having trouble getting information about the patient's insurance or vision plan, I'll repeat what they said to, to me so that I make sure I have it right. And oftentimes I don't have it right. And they have to say to me, no, actually what I meant was this. And so we kind of further refine our conversation and the points of it by active listening. Leading by example. We won't get where we want to go if we aren't modeling the behavior we want to see our team exhibit. My father instilled this next phrase into my head by saying it probably two million times when I was a kid, actions speak louder than words. And so the words that we choose are important, but more importantly, the actions to back up that is the, the actions that we, and our behaviors to back up those words is what's paramount. I believe that, and I've seen this in my own practice and those other practices that I've been a consultant for, that teams will follow the leader when they believe the values are upheld at the highest level. And that if you have the right team in place, their why, in other words, the reason they work in your practice, will be aligned and tied into the same values and purpose set forth by the leader. Last point before we open up the questions is, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint, so be patient. Be patient with yourself as you make these changes. Be patient with your team as you make these changes because it does take time to change habits. So I wanna invite you to reach out and connect with me. Um, this is my website and my email address below that. Uh, I do offer complimentary consultations uh, and you can feel free to email me to get on the email list. Um, and I really, have a passion for helping private practice because I feel like it is the best way to receive eye care in our country and that we're at threat for, for losing some of uh, the amount of the market that we have because you know we have to we have a lot of com competition so uh, with that Yvonne what um, what questions do we have that have come in yeah, so we, we kind of answer some of the questions as we move through the presentation. But one of the comments or thoughts that I have for you as, as we're nearing the 3 o'clock hour here is you talked a lot about active listening, um, being open for feedback. And one of the things that you and I talked about over the weekend was, you know, it's great to do all of those sorts of things, but then what do you do with that feedback at the end of the day? Do you, you know, take it in and then you run another direction, or do we actually do something about it to bring, you know, peace or, you know, harmony or whatever it is that we need to fix. Yeah, so your question is, what, what do we do with the feedback specifically? So yeah. 
Yeah, so um, this is a really important point. I'm really glad you asked that because this is another area where if we don't take action, if there's no change or they don't see that we, you know, really did anything or had regard for their feedback, then they can be kind of reluctant to give us feedback in the future. So, you know, some things that we do is we create our own checklists and our own, you know, timeline with seeing the change that we want to see. Sometimes it involves interpersonal issues. And so we might sit down with that team member and the team member that there's a concern with and have a radically candid conversation where, you know, it's very honest and open about how one person feels about another. Um, and then sometimes the request that we get or the feedback that we get, we, we can't do anything about. Let me give you an example. I had a team member say, I, I really want us to start wearing jeans on Fridays. I want casual Fridays. That's the feedback I have for you this time, Dr. Golson. And I said, you know what? Thank you so much for that feedback. I really appreciate it. And I understand why you might want that. And I have to tell you, uh, I, we can't do that for our patients because our patients expect us to be a professional office. And we really want to have that feel when they come in, whether it's a Monday, Tuesday, or Friday. And so, you know, I really appreciate you asking that, but I just can't do it. So I guess to answer your question, Yvonne, it depends on the situation, but the important piece is that there is clarity in the response and follow-up as well. Yeah, that's exactly what I was looking for. Um, oh. So thank you for that, Dr. Golson. Um, you know, this was, uh, I, like I said in the very beginning, like I had to do a little bit of research to, you know, understand what psychological safety was. It was one thing to hear you talk about it, but then to dive into it a little bit deeper. Um, on my own account. Um, so this was pretty eye-opening for me. Definitely learned a lot of things, you know, on for myself, uh, you know, as I look forward to the next however many years I have left in my career. But I uh, want to definitely thank you so much for sharing your insight and your experience and how you've created and cultivated a culture uh, within your own practice. Um, so, you know, Hey everyone, just we have another great series of webinars coming up in just a few weeks and we'll be digging into optical profitability, which really promises to be a fantastic topic. Um, you're going to receive a follow-up email from iThrive tomorrow with a link to a very brief survey. Uh, your opinions really matter to us here and we want to deliver content that's interesting to you and really helps you manage your business and make it the best it can possibly be. Our survey really should only take you about three minutes of your time, so please help us out. Be sure to complete that. Um, again, Dr. Golson, thank you so much. Any questions that you might have, you can drop it into his email. Everyone have a great day, and we'll see you back in just a few short weeks. Thank you. Have fun skiing. <laughs> Appreciate it.